UCB Life Issues with Paul Hammond. And as always, a very warm welcome to this week's Life Issues. Now, Patrick Regan, OBE, to give him his proper title, is an activist whose passion is speaking about resilience, courage and well-being. He's founded two award-winning charities, XLP and most recently Kintsugi Hope, in partnership with his wife, Diane. And they use in Kintsugi the image of Japanese pottery that has been broken but repaired using golden glue so that the scars become mark of beauty in the hands of a master craftsman, they use that to show how God can work in our lives. Over the years, he's joined me for a couple of Life Issues podcasts, and his passion is that we will be honest as individuals, society, and as a church about our struggles with our mental health, and not just in terms of talking about it either. What he really wants is that we will do something about it, that we will cooperate with God's work of Kintsugi in our lives and the lives of those around us, and put in place frameworks that mean individuals don't have to suffer alone but can find a meaningful pathway to brighter days. Which just so happens to be the title of his latest book and project, BrighterDays.life. Once again, working with his regular writing partner, Lisa Hoxma, Brighter Days is 12 Steps to Strengthening Your Well-Being. Well, Patrick is with me, and while we're not going to go through all 12, we thought we'd give you a flavour of this new project by picking out four. So... Welcome again. 12 steps. That sounds a bit familiar. Where did the idea come from? Well, you know, um, the Kintsugi Hope Wellbeing Groups are based on 12 steps um, to wellbeing. And, uh, and that's loosely based on Alcoholics Anonymous, which, uh, again, is 12 steps. So, so, yeah, we thought, you know, stick with what works. Um, works for many, many thousands of people around the world. Let's, let's keep with that. <laughs> and it is, I mean, the, the idea of it is to create, as you did with Kintsugi, I suppose, create a, a sense of a developing journey. So are these 12 steps also consecutive? Do you have to work your way through them? Or are they more of a, well, here's a thought for this situation, here's a thought for that situation? Yeah, probably a bit of the second bit, actually. I, I always think the way Kintsugi works um, is more like a buffet rather than a set menu. So what it is, is there's just loads of content. And particularly with this book, I really wanted to write a book when I was struggling with my mental health, people um, kept recommending books to me and uh, and normally they were very thick and very dense and full of medical language that I didn't really understand. And, and my head was all over the place. I couldn't read a chapter uh, uh, coherently, you know. And so when I wrote this book, I wanted to write it for someone who was really struggling. And so I wrote it with, uh, with that in mind. So short stories, poems, illustrations, things that could really help if you could get hold of it, you know, little tools that we can use for our well-being. Um, you know, Paul, I live in Chompsford in Essex, which is really flat. And uh, I have a dog called Hope, which I know is a really stupid name for a dog. <laughs> um, you imagine my poor neighbours, they heard me basically for six months shouting out at the top of my voice every morning, no hope! Um, <laughs> they thought me and my wife were going to get divorced. Um, in fact, they actually heard me shout out, Diane, I've lost hope. <laughs> She's jumped over the fence. But I live in Essex, it's really flat, but wherever I take Hope for a walk, I try and find a little incline. And just to get a little bit higher, just to get a different perspective. Mm. And I guess with brighter days, that's what I was hoping for, that maybe it would just give people a, a tool, a little bit of hope, a little spark, which actually helps them look at their their lives, their mental health, their well-being, their emotional health, just a little bit differently. Because um, small changes can make a dramatic difference. And, uh, and that was my prayer for this book. And as you say, it is very much written in bite-sized chunks. It has, even within the chapters, and the chapters are not onerous to read, but even within the chapters, there are obvious cut-off points where people can take a pause, can take time to reflect, or just put it down and come back the next day and pick it up again. So it, it is very accessible. From your point of view, if it's going to work, I mean, the you... You lay it out pretty clearly, you know, brighter days, 12 steps to strengthening your well-being. You're not kind of being vague about what you hope it's going to do. If it's going to work for me, what do I need to do to really engage with this? 
I mean, I think it's like anything, you know, you need to, you need to sort of throw yourself into it really. And, uh, and I think the key about this book is, is practical. That's what I love, all the endorsements, you know, when you get, uh, you send your book off and you wait for the endorsements to come back and, and that's a sort of like a terrifying wait, you know, and uh, what are they going to say? And, uh, and what I loved about what, what people said was, oh man, it was so practical, which means that hopefully if you apply this particular wellbeing tool to your life, it's going to make a difference and I think that's what I really wanted to do um, Paul whenever I write a book at the end of it I always go I'm never writing another book another book ever again and my wife sort of rolls her eyes at me and says <laughs> yeah, yeah. six months and um, but with this one the reason I did it it was uh, over six months probably six or eighteen eight, eight months period I had three people come up to me and, and basically said hand on heart I'm not sure I'd be alive today if it wasn't for one of your books. Um, it met me in a really, really dark place. And I was like, you know, over the last 30 years of doing this type of work, I've learned stuff that works. And I thought, let me pour all of yeah. that into this book. Um, I wrote it for a general market audience really intentionally um, because I wanted to take the content into businesses. Um, last night I was speaking at an awards evening in a school, 400 people were there. Um, the previous week I was speaking at a local council event and I just think everyone needs to invest in their well-being and if we put our well-being first we'd be a totally different society. And the truth is the the imagery of it and the imagery of the title and I, and I suppose the the chapter titles for anybody that has looked at this sphere I mean they're they're pretty familiar so you've you've got a chapter on honesty and anxiety and depression and shame and anger grief and loss perfectionism yeah. forgiveness and so on it goes through so I mean it's 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 familiar fair in in some ways but it does seem to me that you have tapped a nerve with the the image of it because so many people feel as though they are living under a dark cloud and just longing for the sky to clear and to see a shaft of sunlight break through yeah absolutely and you know i, I say in the book that to say there's going to be a brighter day you have to admit there's there's been dark days and i think the book's very real and honest about that um, there's a story in the book where my wife, um, who became my carer for a while when I was going through major limb reconstruction surgery, and during that period of my time, my mental health was spiraling out of control. I just felt like I was falling and I couldn't stop myself. And, uh, you know, some people are like, well, just pray your way out of it and do this and do that. <laughs> yeah. I just felt like nothing was working for me. And, uh, and of course, um, because I had a very visible injury, um, people gave me a lot of attention, but my wife was really struggling. And, uh, and she said that one day she just had enough, you know, she went into her bedroom. It's my bedroom as well. I'm glad to say. And uh, she basically went, I just can't do this anymore. And you know, that saying there's always light at the end of the tunnel. It was almost like the tunnel's too long. I can't see the light yeah, at the end yeah. of the tunnel. It just feels too dark. And she just felt this sense inside of her saying, stop looking for light at the end of the tunnel. And she was like, well, that's not very encouraging. And it was like, look up, see the pinpricks of light in the love of your community and your friends. And, and you know what, just take a day at a time. And if you have to, just take an hour at a time and, and, and get through. And I think that sometimes that's, that's what we can help people do, you know. Um, there's a Chinese proverb in the book, which I absolutely love, that says, it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. Yes. And, and when I think of society, when I think about what's going on in Gaza or Ukraine or even the mental health crisis here in the UK, I'm thinking I'd rather light a candle yeah. than curse the darkness. Yeah. I'd rather be that person that goes, you know what? It's not all despair. There is hope. And if there's a flicker of light, then actually, then let's go for that and uh, fan that into flame. You're listening to UCB Life Issues. I'm Paul Hammond. My guest uh, this week is Patrick Regan. We're talking about his latest book and initiative. It's called Brighter Days, 12 Steps to Strengthening Your Wellbeing. Uh, who's it published by, Patrick? Uh, SVCK. And so you can find it online. And there's also an audiobook version of it. Yeah, which I have to say, Paul, uh, a lot of respect for you guys, you know. Um, that was that was a challenge and a half. 
<laughs> yeah. People think it's easy. You just switch the microphone on and speak, but you know, it takes a bit of practice. It really does. It is a great book, as we mentioned already, very accessible, especially if you are struggling with your mental health, very clearly written to enable you to have those bite-sized chunks that you might need. And although we can't, and, and we wouldn't go through all 12 chapters of it, all 12 steps of it, we did think, as I said earlier, we'd give you a flavour by picking out four. So I wonder if we can start with the ideas and the concepts in the chapter around shame, because each chapter starts with a little phrase. And in shame, it says this, never allow your shame to tell you that you are not worthy of connection, belonging and love. Unpack these thoughts for us a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think shame is, is, is one of the key issues to look at when you look at your mental health. And, you know, Brené Brown's done a lot of amazing work on this. And I think there's the, the first thing to say, there's a massive difference between guilt and shame. Yeah. You know, guilt is, I've done something wrong. You know, if, if some of my workforce, um, some of my colleagues here are late every day for work, I want them to feel guilty because <laughs> then the next day they may be on time. Um, so true guilt can push us to be better maybe, but um, shame isn't saying I've done something wrong. Shame is believing that I am wrong and, uh, and I'm not worthy of love. I'm not, you know, it's that sense of feeling completely worthless. And then, you know, Brené Brown rightly says that shame loves silence, secrecy and judgment and that it has two gremlins. Shame says to you, who do you think you are and you're not enough? And then I think what happens is shame drives different behaviors like perfectionism, which we talk about in the book, and then which then drives anxiety. And so shame often is that key point which we need to deal with. And, uh, and that's why I think it's a really important chapter to talk about. Um, what does it, I mean, you, you've touched on it there, but can we just unpack a little bit more what it does to me? When shame takes hold of my thought patterns and takes hold of my my well-being what does it create in my perspective yeah i think the messages that shame creates is that sense of you know good um you know if you try something new oh you shouldn't have tried that you're gonna you knew you're gonna fail um you should have known better and and, and constantly telling you that you're a failure that you're not worth anything and so that feeling and feeling worthless. So then if you don't value yourself, then you don't treat yourself very well, do you? Um, and and sometimes, you know, I've seen it with other, other people as well. You know, if you don't value yourself, then why should you value others? And so it really just comes down to that key. You know, there's an illustration in the book I found really helpful. And uh, I don't know when you as a kid you used to go to the um, the pier, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, a machine there called Whack-A-Mole. Um, or whack a crock, but um, whack a mole where these moles appear, you know, and then you've got a hammer and you whack them and, and obviously they then disappear and then they just come quicker and quicker and quicker until you're frantically trying to whack these moles as fast as you can. And, uh, and of course, um, it's never possible. Mm. And uh, my friend, a really good friend, uh, Will Vanderhart, who's done a lot of writing on shame, he says, you know, it's a little bit like perfectionism pops up in our life and we try and whack it or anxiety pops up and we try and whack it. But actually, we've got to ask ourselves is what's driving the perfectionism? What's driving the anxiety? And the answer is normally shame. And, uh, and of course, to, in order to, for the moles to pop up, <laughs> to stop popping up, you need to turn the machine off. You need to do something radical to have a radical reset. And, and I think that's a, the antidote to shame is always going to be empathy, it's always going to be understanding, and it's always going to be compassion and getting our head around that. But the, the problem is for many people, I suppose, that shame starts, and, and I get your point that shame can become an all-consuming mindset, but, but it does often start because we do something, because we let somebody down, because we, we yeah. um, fail somewhere, because we, yeah. we do things that cause pain and hurt to others, and then confronted by that, we are ashamed of it and then we transfer that shame to ourselves so how do we yeah. break that pattern how do we break that hold yeah and i think i think it's fair to say that shame can start from for many different factors as well you know um um trauma is a huge um driver to shame and uh, um and, and sometimes religious beliefs as well you know i've mm -hmm. known a lot of people that have been within the church community who've been 
almost shamed into certain types of behavior, almost like told you're so worthless that you can't do anything then, and then actually results in, and, and I never think that shame's a great motivating no. tool. I think, um, I think it's very, very deadly, and very dangerous. And, uh, and I think the first thing that to say is the key to actually dealing with anything is that awareness, isn't it? Is that self-awareness. Um, Stephen Convoy, who wrote that book, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, sold 40 million copies. And basically, if you could distill it into one thing, the most effective people who deal with stuff are those that are self-aware. Um, though that I go, actually, I recognize that behavior in myself. And, uh, and I think that the antidote to shame is actually trying to, so instead of treating yourself with harsh words, is learning to actually treat yourself with compassion and uh, self-compassion. And that's something, again, that we unpack further in the book, because a lot of these themes intertwine, don't yes, they? Yeah. And believe. And, uh, and actually, instead of actually, and, and it's a habit that needs to be cultivated. You know, that's the thing, because it doesn't always come naturally. And then, of course, you know, as Christians, we believe, you know, that um, uh, that that God's love is something that is the antidote to shame as well. Um, I love the bit in the book where it talks about what would God's first words be to you, and uh, and so often I think that we think, well, maybe it'll be, oh, you know, welcome, but you could have done that a bit better. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yes. um, it's just about scraped in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but wouldn't it be amazing if, you know, God's first words, Brendan Manning says this, is, um, did you believe how much I love you? Mm. Did you get it? Did you believe how much I love you? And uh, and I think that is almost letting that sink in is one of the best antidotes to shame. Yeah. Let, let's take a look at some of the moles then, if we're playing whack-a-mole, and if shame is the machine, some of those things that do pop up and blight our lives. One of the ones that you pick out in the book is the idea of perfectionism. And you say this, perfectionism is a moving target we will never hit. But isn't it actually good to aim to be the very best we can? Or is that maybe something different to perfectionism? No, I think there's a massive difference between perfectionism and trying your best. Um, I think perfectionism is about that unrelenting standards that we put ourselves under, that we get all our identity through achieving the whole time. Perfectionism causes depression, it can cause anxiety, it can cause a whole host of very serious mental health disorders, actually. And and it is it's a moving target you never hit. You know, going back to my... Um, my dog, Hope, uh, when I take her for a walk, uh, you know, I take her to the fields. She has got one thing on her mind. And the one thing she has on her mind and she's had on her mind every day for the last five years <laughs> is as soon as I let her off the lead is I'm going to catch a rabbit. And she like races off into the distance. And then within two minutes, she comes back absolutely exhausted. And, uh, and in five years, she's never caught a rabbit. You know? <laughs> and... And I think perfectionism is a bit like that. It's like we, we waste so much time trying to hit this target that we're never going to hit. And uh, I was speaking at this awards evening in a school yesterday, and I was saying to the kids, you know, trying your best is not is a fantastic thing. But you've got to realize that life isn't going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, we want the perfect relationship, the perfect marriage, um, the perfect career. Life hits you hard at times. And uh, and if you're trying to hit that perfectionism target, you're always going to feel disappointed and, and unworthy and, and feeling like you're a failure. So, yeah, well, it's a really important topic. To well, I took a look at the chapter on it and you've got a, an interesting, well, I think it's an interesting definition of perfectionism. And I suspect it would be very different to, to most people's sort of instinctive idea as to what perfectionism is. Because you, you say the perfectionism the thing about it is that you're continually asking yourself am i good enough is there something wrong with me how can i earn people's approval so they will accept me how can i push myself harder how can i do better how can i be better and, and the moment i read it i thought yeah, you're absolutely right I and mean, that's what perfectionism is it is that continual craving that that we will be approved of by dotting every i and crossing every t and and by controlling every element the thing is 
it is something that society seems to aspire mm-hmm. to. And, and it, you know, you, you look at it there, there's an awful lot of workplaces where that's what's expected of people, let alone what we drive ourselves to. I 100% agree with you. And I think, uh, I think uh, we live in a very perfectionist society. I think our education system, for instance, you know, there's, there's a part in the, I think it's in the perfectionist chapter where I talk about my daughter, Abigail, who has some additional needs. And I remember sitting down with her ahead of year and, and we were talking to the fact that due to Abigail's additional needs, it's unlikely that she'll get GCSEs. She has a, a sight condition called nystagmus. She has other additional needs, ADHD, autism, all sorts of things. And uh, and the teacher was saying, I don't think she'll get a GCSE. And I said, um, can I ask you a question? If there's a GCSE in integrity or kindness or teamwork, how do you right. think she'd get on? Yeah. And uh, she go, she get a star, and I went, that's good enough for me, you know. And and she said, this is what she's saying. So often, as teachers, we feel like we're dancing to a tune we don't believe in, and uh, because the the whole culture is achieve this, and that you know you will be able to get that, and and it's all about and and actually we're not looking at education in the round, you know, educating someone for life, those life skills. As an employer, I know that actually what I'm looking for in people is that sense of teamwork, is that sense of living to their values. And uh, and so we do, we live in a very perfectionist society. We, I think there's a underlying in that to be successful, you need to be wealthy. And then you look at all the people that are super famous and super wealthy, and they all seem quite miserable. <laughs> and so it is this illusion that we're never going to hear. And our society, actually, we, we need to have a good look at uh, what we do, the values we promote and how we promote them and ask ourselves, given the mental health of our young people and generally it, it's not working. And given that perfectionism, and again, this is this is in the chapter in the book, but given that perfectionism does drive us in that way, does mean that we, we live a life where we are always worried about what others think of us or whether we are, are matching up to others' expectations of us and, and all that sort of thing. And, and granted of how that empowers shame and its control in our eyes, one of the things that you suggest is that it is time for us, and it is a very biblical idea, this is a very Christian idea, it is time for us to embrace brokenness, not to accept substandard integrity as on, but to embrace the fact that we are not perfect and we will not be perfect. When we get that message, when we, when we take hold of that, what sense of liberty and freedom does that bring? Mm, huge it's huge sense of liberty and freedom you know just to know that you're being accepted for who you are flaws and all and uh, because then you can be truly known because then you can actually show up as your true self because otherwise you know so often what we do is we don't show up our true selves we try and portray this almost like i've got it all sorted type of self um and and that isn't true so we can't be truly known because that isn't really us and uh, and again in the book one of the my favorite quotes actually in the book is from brian stevenson um brian stevenson works um with uh people on death row you know and uh, this guy has uh, achieved everything i mean he's won every award that you can he's been recognized as one of the best speakers in the world and and uh, and he talks about embracing our brokenness creates a need and desire for mercy and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy. Yeah. So when you experience mercy, you learn things that are hard to learn otherwise. You see things you can't otherwise see, and you hear things that you can't otherwise hear. You begin to recognize that humanity lies in every single one of us. And then you start to build really meaningful, um, deep relationships. You're listening to UCB Life Issues. I'm Paul Hammond. Talking this week to Patrick Regan. He is the author of, amongst many other books, he is the author of Brighter Days, published by SPCK. Brighter Days, 12 Steps to Strengthening Your Well-Being. And recognising that we all could do with strengthening our well-being. We're not going through all 12, but we are giving you a flavour of what he is suggesting. And perhaps the suggestion that we need to look beyond the traditional understanding of some of these issues to see a simpler way to actually mend the pottery yes we're back to a kintsugi reference there again can we talk about anxiety 
for a minute and one of my personal bugbears and and something which which kind of dogged my steps for a long time and every so often rears its head again to go hello i'm still here if you'd like to take note of me the the little phrase at the beginning of the chapter says if you struggle with anxiety i want you to know that you are loved you are valued and you have a massive contribution to make to this world i found that very encouraging but what on earth has Tetris got to do with it? <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, if you're of a certain age, you remember the computer game called Tetris. That is the thing <laughs> of my nightmares, that tune. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure uh, many of your listeners will know what it is. But t- Tetris was a computer game where basically all these blocks, they fell out of the sky. And you have to rotate them because all different sizes and get them in a straight line. Uh, once you get in a straight line, the line disappears. But the problem is is they just keep coming and they get quicker and quicker and quicker so you're frantically hitting your keyboard to try and keep going and eventually it's just game over and i think the challenge is paul is that things do tend to go wrong at once don't they um life is never straightforward and um i think someone said to me the other day actually if you look at a map if you look at new york and london it looks like a straight line but actually a pilot will never go in a straight line because the weather conditions are different every single day. Yeah. They're probably going to go up, they're probably going to go down. Uh, sometimes it's going to be quicker, sometimes it's going to be slower. And, and that is life. It is. It, it, it happens. But I think the thing about for me, my anxiety was sort of a real game changer for me, actually, was realizing that anxiety isn't weakness, that anxiety often means that you're caring too much. Um, there is a, an incredible quote in the book from a lady called Kirsty Corlin who says that anxiety is often the most caring person in the room. Yeah. And that made me think about anxiety totally differently because, you know, I had it drummed into me, you know, those verses from Philippians, do not be anxious about anything. And then I just felt like rubbish because I felt like I'm anxious about everything, not <laughs> about anything. I'm anxious about everything. And, uh, and how can anxiety be the most caring person in the room? And, and I realized as I started to think about people that I know that struggle with anxiety is that people that struggle with anxiety are often kind, sensitive, have incredible empathy. But there's a bit of like a, a car alarm. You know, car alarm is useful. Uh, it has a purpose. If it's going off all the time, it's a bit annoying for you and for everyone else. But it has a function. And so sometimes I think it's about managing our anxiety. Yes and uh, and using it for good and uh, and not for something that's going to cause us uh, pain and put it in the right framework but of course for many people especially it seems in this modern age at least in the part of the world where we live anxiety does seem to be such a powerful driver and again it comes back to those images of shame and am i good enough am i ex- going to be accepted am i going yeah. uh, what if i get it wrong what if i can't deal with this control and that all mixes into it as well and you go through a list of things that you say are unhelpful things to say to someone who struggles with anxiety things like you'll be fine or cheer up things could be worse you know, usually at that point the person with anxiety will wants to punch you on the nose and more how about here's a coloring book (laughs) you know (laughs) the thing is when you take it out of context then you sort of make it stand alone like that it seems ridiculous doesn't it but i wondered if we could just focus in for a moment on some of the things you say are good things to say things like i'm here anytime you need me your feelings are valid take one step at a time don't belittle yourself what you're facing sounds hard. I'll stay with you. There's a very, for me, it is very redolent of the messaging we get of how Jesus walked with his disciples and says, by through the Holy Spirit, he walks with us. Yeah, 100%. And the fascinating thing about this chapter, actually, is because normally when I write books, um, you know, I do so much research because my perfectionism takes hold and think like, I've got to read every single book on this topic. And uh, so I literally read this ridiculous amount of books on psychology books and theology books and books by activists. And, 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 I, and I did all that <laughs> for this book. But also what I did for every chapter, I I did something on social media and I said, um, what does anxiety feel like to you? Yeah. And within literally a couple of hours, I'd have a hundred different answers. Yeah. And it was 
fascinating what people are writing and uh, and these these bits that you just mentioned came out of that conversation I was having in, in on social media you know what's the helpful things what's the unhelpful things and I think when it comes to the helpful things is this sense of being alongside and uh, not being the rescuer which is sometimes hard because you know I feel like as a parent and as a friend I want to rescue, I want to like, you know, but actually coming alongside is what people really want. They want you. And uh, and I often think about Jesus on the road to Emmaus, you know, it's the day after the resurrection. And uh, if a marketing person had come up to Jesus at that point, <laughs> I think he would have gone, you know what, Jesus, could we do one of those sort of feeding of the 5,000 geeks? Yeah, we get yeah. a message out that you're alive. Or Sermon on the Mount, part two would be amazing at this point. And it's almost like the day after Jesus' resurrection, he decides that he's going to spend the whole morning walking alongside two people that no one's ever heard of. Yeah. And uh, who are heartbroken, who are struggling with anxiety, disappointment, grief, confusion. And the thing I love about this story is as he's walking alongside, um, he doesn't say, you know, they start saying, have you not heard, you know, Jesus has died. And he, at no point does he go, guys, stop. I'm Jesus. Da -da. We don't need to have this conversation anymore. Um, it's all good. You know, he lets them share their pain and their heartache. And then they get to Emmaus. And even when they get to Emmaus, you know, they persuade him to have dinner with them. Um, he still hasn't done the big reveal. And then I think it's fascinating that as he breaks the bread, um, they work out who he is. Brokenness reveals who Jesus is every single time. And, uh, and I've just learned a lot from that, you know, I, I need to learn to shut up and listen and come alongside and, and to be gentle, you know, and that's yes. another thing I look at in the book, that gentleness is actually strength, it's not, it's not weakness. To be gentle in a world that's just telling you to speed up and hurry up and be strong, to be gentle actually is what people are looking for. thing is, one of the things that you suggest we need to do in order to address our anxiety is to see reality but mm. and and many i mean i we we've done many programs over the years where therapists and so on will talk about you know seeing the reality as a way to to cognitively combat your anxiety and so on and so forth the, the trouble is when you are consumed by anxiety it's hard to accept the reality that isn't shaped by your your vision of anxiety and you you suggest this idea of taking our thoughts to court which i thought was brilliant i it's so simple when you stop and think about it just quickly unpack that one for us what what do you mean by that yeah, again, I was just trying to think of tools that you can use during the day, you know, and because uh, we all know that you, we're not going to stop negative thoughts. You know, they're just going to come in like trains come into a train station. And uh, that is the reality. But take the thought to court is actually going, you know, if you put that thought in the dock, is there enough evidence to suggest that thought is true? Mm. You know, question it. Is that what I, you know, my friends would say? Is that what a judge would say? Well, what, what, you know, is there, you know, what's the closing statement? And the reality is, most of the time, is that it, it's not true. Um, or there's an element of truth in it. And it doesn't have the same power when you start to put it into that sort of framework. And uh, so that's for me, there's a little practical tip that as I go through my day and I bang, there goes another negative thought. I think All right, I'm going to take this one to court and see, yeah. <laughs> see how I get on. Because it is almost like shining a light on it and actually saying yeah. how, how, because so often the thought comes and we go, oh, that's true. And we run away in, in, yeah. and hide in the darkness. But actually to, to bring it out into the, the brighter day, <laughs> see what I did there. Yeah. yeah. That, it, it does make a difference. <laughs> A hundred percent, you know, and, and then you, you, you get that sense of freedom and liberty because you realize that actually, you know, we all use absolute statements a lot of the time, you know, I, I'll always be like this, I'll never be able to get free or uh, I'm, I'm completely useless. And actually, you know what, you may have failed at that particular aspect of your job or something may have happened, but the reality is that's not your identity, that's not who you are. And, uh, and I think that's, that's really important uh, to recognize. 
You're listening to UCB Life Issues. I'm Paul Hammond. Speaking to Patrick Regan, we're talking about, as I've said many times already, we're talking about this incredibly accessible book that he's written that just brings a very sort of everyday reality onto the the subject of coping with our well-being. It's called Brighter Days, published by SBCK. 12 Steps to Strengthening Your Well-Being. There is a website that goes with it. Have a look at that for yourself as well. Brighterdays.life. Brighterdays.life. As say the 12 steps we haven't got time to talk about all 12 so we picked out four one of the ones i was very keen for us to take a look at is the chapter that you do on the subject of resilience i wonder if you could first tell us what resilience is and what it isn't because that's where the little phrase at the beginning of the chapter starts isn't it yeah, I mean, I always think of resilience as the ability to bounce forwards. Um, and that was the title of my previous book. And I think a lot of people think resilience is the ability to bounce back. And when I did my research, I had a real issue with that because, you know, people talking about an elastic band and, you know, a ball that bounces back and that's resilience. And I was like, you know, I feel like life does change us, you know. And uh, I wrote Bouncing Forwards uh, when the pandemic was coming on. And I was like, you know, the pandemic's changed. It, it's changed me. It's changed my values. It's changed the way I think about the world. And, and why would I want to go back to my pre-trauma self <laughs> and learn all those lessons again? And, uh, and so we started to look at what does it mean to bounce forwards and what does it mean to take this, the, the challenges, that, you know, whether that's the, the pain that we've been through and the good stuff, the bad stuff. And, and then I start to think about resilience as not that adversity won't ever be there, but how do you thrive in the midst of adversity? How do you build that sense of resilience? And uh, and I think it was interesting, as soon as you say the word resilience to people, um, some people react because I feel like what's happened is we've misunderstood it. We've said, you know, it's just about battling on. It's yeah. just about pushing through. It's you know um there are no limits and, and that's that's again a very cultural message we have you know we will celebrate that sort of one out of a hundred person that does something incredible against all odds and we'll say that's resilience where actually i think there's a maturity in accepting that we are limited you know there are only 24 hours in a day you know i have a knee condition that means i can't run i can't do this stuff and uh and actually accepting that's okay. And, uh, and I think part of resilience is not repressing our emotions and just putting on a mask and keep going uh, with toxic positivity, but is accepting where we're at and learning that we can thrive in the midst of adversity. Yeah, and, and I get that and I understand that. And I, I immediately, instinctively agree with you that, that there's sort of the almost macho drive through, just keep going no matter what, keep running up that hill sort of mentality. It, it, that No matter how great the storm is, we will not flag. The truth is sometimes yeah. we flag and sometimes we have limits and sometimes we can't go any further. It, it, it's, it's obvious. So what then is resilience? How, how do we define resilience in our everyday experience and in the things that we are facing every day? What is it? If it's not just pushing through, what is it? Yeah, I mean, there was an interesting lady called Libby Webb, and uh, she talks about resilience as um, putting on a sunscreen. And I was like, what does that mean? And she's going, it's not shielding yourself away from the sun because uh but it's actually putting on a protective layer which means that it will actually help you to be able to keep doing the stuff that you need to do even when the sun's out and i think that's quite a helpful analogy um to think about resilience and uh, and and another really helpful analogy which has helped me no end and i've heard so many stories uh, and we use it in the book is what's called the resilience river yeah and uh, and it's from a guy called professor patrick batoni who says like every river virtually has rocks at the bottom and what uh, you know and those rocks represent tough stuff that we go through in our lives and many books describe how you get those rocks out of your river you know um so a rock for me is anxiety i struggle with anxiety it doesn't control me the, the way it used to but it's still there you know, um, perfectionism, I know that I'm prone to it. Um, loss, my uncle died a year ago and he's not coming back and I miss him. 
But I know if my resilience with it is low and I'm rowing my boat on it, I'm going to crash into those rocks. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so we're looking at how do we keep our resilience with a high, which means the rocks don't disappear. They're still there. But actually, we can float across them. And I think the really interesting thing about that is one size never fits all. So the things that drain your river and the things that drain my river may be very different. Um, and the things that raise us up and actually keep us at a level kill may be different as well. And, and so I love, I, I've been going into businesses, I've been going into universities, and we've been doing this exercise of all different types of people from different types of society. And I love it because everyone's different. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important to reflect on, on what actually keeps you um, resilient at those difficult times. And recognising what drains your river and what keeps it full is important recognizing the reality of the presence of the rocks is important as well in fact you you actually in the chapter you talk about how acceptance of the realities of our weaknesses our failings the the things that impact us the things that triggers us a, accepting that is the key so for me acceptance is absolutely key and and this was the bit paul i really struggled with as a christian because i had so many people that used to say to me patrick you can't accept that negative thought yeah um as soon as that negative thought hits your brain you need to bash it with the word of god you know and i just got exhausted and then i just felt guilty that i was doing a really bad job at it and uh, and actually it was um i got to meet archbishop desmond tutu once and do some stuff with him i hope you caught that name as it dropped there i'll just pick and, it up for you uh, give me a second <laughs> and he said acceptance and resignation are two really different things yes and that made me really think that acceptance is always the first path to healing and, and then I started to do more research and particularly looked at um, Holocaust survivors and uh, survivors of POW camps. And the interesting thing uh, that, about that research was the people that died um, in those camps and in Auschwitz and places like that were the optimists. The optimists would be like, I'll be out by January, I'll be out by Easter. And of course, you know, Christmas and Easter came and went and they were still there and they died. The people that did the best were those that accepted the situation they were in, um, uh, adapted to it, and even found some meaning in the pain. And and they're the guys. And, and, and of course, there's something else which there was a great deal of luck as well. And I think they'd be the yeah. first to say that. Yeah. But actually, that is significant. And so I've, I've learned when I thought about resilience, you know, accept the situation you're in, adapt, adjust, and maybe even find some meaning, some purpose in the pain. But there's a key point there, isn't there? There's a key point in what um, Archbishop Tutu said to you. It, it, it is, there's a difference between resilience and mm -hmm. sort of rolling over and playing dead. And and it's yeah. it's really important. I mean, you, you've said it there. It is acceptance and ad adaptation, not acceptance and just sit back in a corner and let it happen. Yeah, a hundred percent. A hundred percent is very different to resignation. And uh, resignation is I quit. I've had it. I can't do it anymore. And and that's very different. And it's a subtle difference. But it's a really important difference mm -hmm. as well, because like, if we don't come to that place of acceptance, we will just end up exhausted and disillusioned. If we just roll over and die, then obviously you know what's the point of that. But if we can accept the situations we're in and adapt to it. And, and, you know, and we do that with our physical health quite a lot. You know, I remember when I went for major limb reconstruction surgery on both my legs, you know, there was no denying I had to go through it and yeah. I had to adapt. Um, but when it comes to our mental health, we don't tend to think about it in the same way. And I think it's important that we actually we, we go through this process. And, uh, and I don't believe that like, everything happens because God causes it, like particularly God causes all the pain and the suffering in my life. But I do believe um, nothing is wasted. And I do believe in that old little saying, you know, your tests become, become your testimony and it can help other people and it makes you hopefully kinder and softer and being able to relate to people in a completely different way. And I know that's been my experience. And, uh, and so uh, people often say, are you glad you went through all the things that you've been through? And I don't think I've got to that place yet. Maybe no. I will one day because it was really hard and really difficult and really dark but i recognize that actually like the art of kintsugi is that god can make something beautiful out of brokenness and, yes. and i've been pretty broken at times 
The book is called Brighter Days, 12 Steps to Strengthen Your Well-Being. The website is brighterdays.life. And the reality is we live in a world where for so many people, it does feel as though there is a cloud over so much of their lives. Finding a way to let the sun shine through, finding a way to connect with a positive improvement to our well-being, finding a way to address the voice of shame or anxiety or perfectionism, to find the security, the river, if you like, of resilience, is absolutely critical for so many who are struggling with just everyday living. The reality with this book, with the truth of faith that lies behind it, is that there is a way to deal with these things honestly, compassionately, with empathy, not with condemnation or blame or unfounded guilt. And in that way, and that core foundation of a relationship with a God who looks at us, sees us as we are, and tells us that we are loved, there is a way to draw back the curtains, open the window, and find a brighter day. Brighterdays.life is the website. Brighter Days, 12 Steps to Strengthening Your Wellbeing is the book. Fascinating concepts in it. Patrick, good to speak to you about it today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And thank you also to Rebecca, my producer for today's program. I'm Paul Hammond. Why not join me next week for another Life Issues? Ta-da. Thank you.